Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wes Express, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wesexpress.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 194, The Worst Man in London. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, since you became astronomer. Huh? In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger streeter regulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burt Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well, hello there, and welcome back to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walter. And Bert, you are not the worst man in podcasting, I'm happy to say. <laughs> well, no, there must be, there certainly must be somebody worse than me in podcasting, although it's a small, there's, it's a small bubbling pot. There's at least two dozen there. others. I at think. least, at least. <laughs> well, we hope to make the next hour or so delightful for you as you're listening. Uh, just a reminder, if you would like to find the show notes for this episode, you can find it at ihose.co slash ihose194, which will take you to our homepage or, or to the specific episode off of our homepage at ihearofsherlock.com. Com. There you can get involved. You can leave us a review. You can help to support the show via Patreon or PayPal. You can leave a comment for us, uh, which you can also do by emailing us at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com or calling us at 774-221-READ. That's 774-221-7323. Or just open a voice recording app on your phone and send us an MP3 connected to an email. That works too. Whatever way you choose to connect with us, we do appreciate it. And we appreciate you telling other people about the show. And don't forget, right after the interview, we have the Canonical Couplet, which is a Sherlockian quiz program where you can win a prize just for answering correctly. So stay tuned right after the interview. <laughs> Holmes and Watson turn to burglary in the adventure of Charles Augustus Milverton, and they seek to thwart the designs of, quote, the worst man in London. This story holds a unique place in the canon for its distinctive villain and the, the great detective's strong natural turn for criminal enterprise, as well as the host of thorny ethical questions raised by his actions. This is the backdrop with which our two guests were faced as they set out to edit the latest issue, or the latest edition of the Baker Street Irregulars manuscript series of Charles Augustus Milverton. So we are joined today by Costa Rizakis, MD, BSI, who's invested as St. Bartholomew's Hospital. He's a consultative cardiologist and collector who's amassed in his private library an unparalleled compilation of Sherlockian source material, including holograph manuscripts, first appearances, jacketed first editions, and original illustrations by the artists Sidney Paget and Frederick Dorr Steele. He's a member of the Grolier Club, a founder and former chairman of the BSI Trust, and he's authored numerous articles relating to bibliographic discoveries on canonical true first editions. Costa, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thank you, Scott. It's so nice to be with you and Bert and uh, my very esteemed co-editor, uh, Daniel Stashauer. 
Excellent. And this is your oh, first time oh, on the, <laughs> This is your first time on the show, isn't it, Costa? It is the first time on the show and I'm I'm so honored to be with you guys. You have no idea. Very humbling experience. Well, we will be gentle, don't worry. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Our other guest is Dan Stassauer, BSI, invested as Thurston. There's a backstory there too about the evening Dan was invested. He's a three-time Edgar-winning author of both fiction and nonfiction. His works of Sherlockian interest include Teller of Tales, The Life of Arthur Conan Doyle, and as co-editor, Arthur Conan Doyle, A Life in Letters. Also, Dangerous Work, Diary of an Arctic Adventure, and The Narrative of John Smith. His most recent book is The Hour of Peril, The Secret Plot to Murder Lincoln Before the Civil War. Dan, welcome back to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thank you, gentlemen. It is a pleasure. <laughs> Let's not forget Dan's Agatha, his Edgars. Okay, just shout out to, to my butt. I paid him to mention that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's great. Well, um, those of you who recall Dan being on the program before, he was here for episodes 13, 38, excuse me, 37 and 48, talking about a number of those books that we mentioned in his bio. Dan, you're an old hand these parts around, and we've heard your backstory, but Costa, why don't you tell us how you first met Sherlock Holmes? Well, my, my first encounter really was in the, in the sixth grade at uh, PS199 grade school in Queens, New York, where I was born and raised. And my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Munchnik, uh, wanted us to do a book report. And I really didn't know which book to do a report on. So he said, well, he goes, you, you like problem solving, which I did and I still do. So why don't you do a book report on Sherlock Holmes? So I went to the Woodside Public Library, actually the Sunnyside Public Library, two blocks away from PS199, got a reprinted edition, took out a reprinted edition of a collection of Sherlock Holmes stories with, by the way, Christopher Morley's epic preface. And without even reading a single Sherlock Holmes story, I read the preface and I was hooked. I knew I was hooked. I was done toast and <laughs> brought the book home. And I read three of the stories that night. I told Mr. Munchnik the following day, I said, this is fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm not sure which story to do. He said, well, because you're Greek, you're Greek American, your parents are from Greece. Why don't you do the Greek interpreter? <laughs> uh, which I did. I, I so wish I still had that book report. And uh, that that's when I fell in love after multiple readings of the canon, so, you know, some of the earlier annotated editions. Um, I, uh, I, be, I began collecting relatively late in, in my life, uh, probably about 20, 25 years ago, studying the patterns of collectors and, you know, what to do, what not to do, but really falling in love with the source material, first editions, manuscripts, where I, I felt at the risk of sounding hokey of uh, as close as possible to the creative process of the author. But anyway, we're going astray here. So that was my first, that was my introduction to Sherlock Holmes in the sixth grade. That's a wonderful one. And, you know, there there's so many instances of uh, Sherlock Holmes and different uh, nationalities or ethnicities. You know, over on our other podcast, Trifles, last year, last season, uh, we did a monthly feature called, uh, I think it was uh, Sherlock Holmes and uh, International uh, connections, and we looked at the influence of Irish and of Italian, and so on and so forth. But you know, the the Greek interpreter really is is only is, is the only instance of uh, of, of Greek influence in the canon, at least direct uh, Greek influence. So, uh, correct, correct. What a, what a what a proud moment for you as a as a Greek American as and as a student in Mister Munchnik's class. It was wonderful. Why don't we Why don't we jump right in here and um, let's Let's talk about the genesis of this this book. I mean, the BSI manuscript series has been going on for 
Oh gosh, 15, 18 years, something along those lines. I've, I've lost track. Where did the impetus come from to select this particular story? And, and how were the two of you chosen above all others to edit it? I mean, I would just say that the, the manuscript series has been amazing. I, it hit the ground running and it's uh, gone from strength to strength. So uh, for, for me, this seemed like a great moment to come on board because the story has always been one of my favorites. I've always loved mm-hmm. Milverton and it meant working with Costa. So uh, to me, it felt like win-win. And, and uh, I, and I agree. Uh, uh, Mike Whalen and, um, and Andy Fusco approached me about five or six years ago, you know, to edit this particular, and I, I just, I love the manuscript series. It's absolutely my favorite for obvious reasons. And I had promised to do it. I had promised to do it. Well, then, you know, two years, three years, four years had gone by. Uh, and again, little inside baseball here. I told him, look, guys, I'm, <laughs> I'm not retired. Um, I do have a very active practice. I mean, I do love what I do, contributing to the literature whenever I can. I just don't know how much time I would have to take on the duties, the responsibilities as as an editor. And I've never edited a non-medical book before. I've edited you know research articles medically, my own little stuff with in, in the Sherlockian community uh, with the, with the first editions. I said, but you know nothing on the scale of this. But I had really wanted to do it. And Andy Fusco recommended. He goes, well, look. He goes. How about if, you know, you we would get a co-editor? I said, co-editor? I said, I game for that. And he said, okay. Uh, about two or three days later, he said, well, what? He goes, Dan Stash Hour. I said, <laughs> I said, the Dan Stash Hour? Uh, I, he, goes, he goes, you know, Dan, I said, I said, Dan and, uh, you know, John Lullenberg had been to my house on at least one or two occasions. Uh, just to go over some material from 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 my library, I said. And I said, Dan is willing to do this. He said, Oh yes. I said, Oh man, this is a, this is a home run. <laughs> so the and, and without and truthfully, guys, I'm not being self-effacing here. Without Dan, this particular edition of the manuscript series would not have happened. It it, it just would not have happened. Uh, and I'm just I feel so lucky to have had Dan involved as co-editor and it was uh, just the stars aligned properly. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's, that's the way this came about. I'm uh, sorry, Dan, but I'm, I'm rambling here. Why, why don't you go ahead? Well, not at all. I mean, uh, honestly, I uh, thank you Costa, but, and, but I, I knew he was going to say that, but I'm, I'm bound to say that in his account of uh, my small achievements, uh, he has habitually underrated his own abilities. This was a collaboration. We went over every piece together. And Costa is good at this type of work. And also, and, you know, it kind of pains me to admit this, I'm not very good at cardiology. So uh, <laughs> there were limits to the reciprocity. Oh, you know, I, I wanted to help out and uh, take up some of the slack at Costa's practice. Uh, but he kept resisting uh, for some reason. He kept asking, are you a doctor? Did you go to medical school? <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It was awkward. <laughs> you guys know that that's not true, right? <laughs> so narrow-minded. So let me ask you a question. Costa, you, you mentioned a few minutes ago, one of the attractions for you in collecting was getting close to the creative process. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the creative process of editing. I mean, Dan, maybe we could start with you because the lovely thing, you know, and there have been a lot of books in the manuscript series, but this is really, really good, you know, and it's so tough because the editorial structure, you know, you have this, you have a bunch of collective voices, you have a story, there are so many different topics, putting it together so that all of it has a collective impact so that the the diverse voices work together, so that the final product is really interesting, is a challenge. And I've read lots of books that have been edited and brought together various essays that have been unsatisfactory uh, because that hasn't been handled well. But Dan, tell us a little bit about how you came up with the editorial structure for this, the voice, uh, selected some of the participants. There's no easy answer to that because uh, I'll, I'll 
there were a lot of different factors coming into play. At the beginning, when Costa and I were talking about pieces we we would like to have uh, have in the collection, there were subjects that we particularly wanted to have handled that were obvious, obviously relevant to the story. Mm-hmm. And sometimes there was an obvious person out there who could be matched up with that subject, and sometimes there weren't. And then in other cases, we were very fortunate in being able to get a contributor who had a particular area of expertise that we could uh, that we could exploit and and take advantage of. And I'm I mean I'm thinking just one example would be Russ Merritt right. on uh, on films. But the, the point you're making about about the uh, the thing coming together and having a structure that was very, very important to us. And in the later stages, when all the pieces were in and and we had them to look at, we spent a lot of time uh, sort of uh, rearranging, kicking the tires, trying to figure out the best way to showcase each piece so that they kind of clicked together and uh, had a collective voice. Would you say that's fair, Costa? I absolutely would say that so and it was it was that was the most fun part by the way is 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 how we piece these together at the end and and dan and i thankfully thankfully for me uh we we were in sync you know probably 95 close to 100 percent of the time and and we were fortunate indeed to have the contributors that we had well i mean Costa, this this goes along with uh, what Mr. Munchnik saw in you in, in terms of your penchant for problem solving, right? I mean, it comes full circle. Well, uh, little things. I, I I like when things align up and when plans come together. Um, and again, it, it, I, and I didn't want to step on anybody's feet, but you know, uh, putting in the the pamphlets for the, for example, the Milvertonians of Hampstead, I thought just added, since we're talking about art, we're talking about film, we're talking about uh, bringing in some contribution, or be even in a pictorial form, as a preface to some of the contributions, three of them specifically, it just added dimension, I felt, to have the only sort of uh, certified or sanctioned science society of the uh, Sherlock Holmes Society of London whose raison d'etre was Charles Augustus Milverton. And to have those earlier contributions dovetail and, and, and those articles and the pamphlets dovetail uh, Richard's, Peter Richard's uh, stuff with, with, with our more contemporary contributions. Um, now, I thought it was now, a really, really cool thing to do. It, it is a cool thing, but I have to tell you, I really wanted to read those articles. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> yeah. Have, have, have you have yeah. you read them? The Milvertonian pamphlets? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. They're wonderful. And that element to it of the uh, is a is a wonderful example of what uh, Costa brought to the to the project in terms of the history and the context and things. Uh, that that was all him. I never would have thought of it, and it brought so much uh, to the collection. Well, you may be hearing more from our sponsor, Wes Express, later in the show about the Milvertonians of Hampstead, if you stay tuned. (laughs) It's possible, yes. (laughs) So, as you were describing the uh, assembly of, of, of authors and contributors, was there anyone whom you really wanted to be part of this that, for whatever reason, simply couldn't? couldn't uh, make it happen gosh uh you know i i we were we were uh lucky humbled and flattered that we were able to get contributions from so many people that that uh, we thought we were maybe uh, uh taking too big a swing and they wouldn't do it and yet they they not only agreed but they came through with uh with wonderful contributions i'm sure there were some people who couldn't do it for uh, scheduling reasons or other issues, but it's not coming to mind now. How about for you, Costa? Dan, you spearheaded this. Anyone that Dan asked agreed. Let's let's put it that way, okay? 
Um, the only person who was really on the fence was yes, no, yes, no. Um, for, you know, and he was busy. He was in the middle of doing, you know, some work related things was Otto. And it was a little disappointing because Otto, you know, initially said yes. Then he said he really doesn't see how he would be able to do it. And he then fortunately for us capitulated, you know, who better to do, you know, the great crooks, uh, you know, than Otto Kensler. So via Dan's gentle prodding, put together a star lineup. Uh, and, yeah. and, and that, that, that was Dan. That was yeah. Dan. Well, I, thre- I, I, I threatened his life. <laughs> uh, yeah. One of the things that our listeners will find in the book, you know, is this sort of wide selection of articles. So you've got, you know, some terrific pieces by example, Jonathan McCafferty, who writes about yeah. one of my favorite subjects, Charles Augustus Howells, who back in the 1860s was yes. probably an inspiration for Milverton. You've got Nick Utekin on the location of Appledore Towers. You've got Otto's terrific essay on the great crooks, which is really fabulous. But also, you know, Randall's done such a nice job on the history of the manuscript, which, of course, is very dear to Costa. And I was surprised at how good a story that was. And even yeah. from even from the start of your introduction to the book by Dan and Costa, you know, something a little recherche, you sort of start with a really interesting fact. It's the fact about were there eight stories or six stories, you know, that Collier's paid Conan Doyle for. Do you want to talk, Costa, a little bit about the manuscript history and Randall's uh, part here? Well, Randall did just just such an amazing job. And if we could digress just a moment, there is a little bit of a backstory there as well, because for the longest time, and I'm guilty of this, you know, we thought that it was eight stories that were contract for. And in fact, uh, we did have definitive proof that it was six, that it was six. As usual, you know, Randall does his, you know, fantastic job um, putting everything together. Were there specific aspects of it in terms of how it came about uh, that you're inquiring about, uh, Bert? No, I'm just, I'm just wanted to get, you know, your perspective on the manuscript history, because in reading Randall's uh, section, in addition to being continually impressed by his research, you know, which is sort of an ongoing thing that happens when Fantastic, you look at, yeah. at, at Randall's work product, the, the, the manuscript history is sort of like shining a flashlight on the whole, on the whole, on decades of interest and involvement in Conan Doyle in manuscripts in auctions in great irregular personalities. And I just thought it was a great, it was a great story. It's a wonderful story. And, uh, you know, the return, the entire collection of the return is, you know, fascinating in and of itself um, that, you know, certainly the collected works, you know, the American and the English, you know, the, you know, the hardest by the way, of the books to find in true collectible condition because they, you know, the public were yearning for more Sherlock, for more Sherlock Holmes. And uh, at the the end of the Victorian and then into the Edwardian period, people were clamoring for this. Uh, and uh, the, the stores were just read, you know, absolutely read to death. As you can see from Randall's article, um, it's amazing how they were put together, uh, truly. And just from a sort of, you know, a nerdy standpoint, and th- this is the way Conan Doyle operated. Uh, not unlike Mozart, uh, he would have a story, he would have characters, names, plots in his head. And with rare exception, would lay the story out completely in manuscript form and would send it to his typist. The typist would type it, obviously, and typically two or three copies were sent out to both the American and the English, Colliers and Strand. Uh, and as is, was usual, the, the closest to the manuscript, generally with the American uh, versions, the Colliers' the first appearance, uh, they were the closest. Uh, the Strand took a little bit more liberty uh, in terms of uh, pre-publication editing, and the English edition was actually the first true appearance, Milverton, in uh, March of 1904. Strand, the Milverton didn't appear in the Strand magazine, UK, until April of 1904. 
Doyle would hold on to these manuscripts, certainly from the return onward, uh, as his notoriety uh, just continued to increase, knowing that, you know, at, at one point, waiting for the millionaire who would never materialize. <laughs> he eventually did. Eventually uh, did. He did. Yes. Well, let's let's take a, a pause here as we have a word from our sponsor, and we'll come back and talk more with Dan Stashauer and Kostrazakis about The Worst Man in London. Stay tuned. The unique features of the Milverton case have inspired Holmesians for years, but none more so than the Milvertonians of Hampstead the first and only science society of the Sherlock Holmes Society of London, a group which devoted itself uniquely to one canonical tale. Between 1958 and 1968, they delved deeply into the case, writing about Charles Augustus Milverton on stage, screen, and radio, about Charles Augustus Milverton among the illustrators, and much more. These publications were produced on a shoestring and seemed lost forever. Now they can be yours. Newly published and available for the first time in 60 years. Introduced, collated, and edited by Nick Utekin. The forgotten writings of the worst men in London are available right now from our wessexpress.com for a paltry 1895. Hey, that's a great number and a great reason to order your copy today. Okay, we're back here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, talking with Costa Rosakis and Dan Stashauer. You know, Costa, we we stopped uh, just before the break talking about the history of the manuscript. I'm interested in in your involvement because this you, you've collected a number of uh, notable items and manuscripts from uh, Conan Doyle are part of that, but this was your your first Sherlock Holmes manuscript, and this is a doozy. I mean, it's 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 got to be all downhill from here, right? I don't know about downhill, but certainly different. Um, and it 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 is a doozy. It is a doozy, and well, I was fortunate enough to get uh, one of the early. Uh, Frederick Dorr Steele's depicting uh, Milverton. Uh, but to say that it's all downhill, eh, I don't know if it's all downhill. Well, I, it's, it's, you, kind, <laughs> it's kind of you to say. Um, if, if this but, is your um, first, though, I mean, what... what it is. What, yes. what prompted you to participate in, in that auction of all others? And, and what, what spoke to you to, to cause you to want to make the purchase? Well, first of all, I absolutely love the story, number one. Number two, I was clamoring for a Sherlock Holmes manuscript. Um, Number three, uh, the fact that it came paired, married to the Frederick Dorr Steele image of Milverton just added exponentially um, to to the lot for me. So I really, I went after it hammer and tongs, and I, I was fortunate enough to to get it. You know, as Costa was talking earlier about this sense of, uh, of awe that you feel in being close to Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator, when you're handling some of these materials and studying some of these materials. And it, it, it made me think of a, a moment I had um, very early on. I was doing some research uh, at, um, at at Cambridge, uh, Cambridge University in England, and I particularly wanted to see the uh, archive of letters back and forth between Conan Doyle and Oliver Lodge. And I filled out all the paperwork, and I they brought them to me in a case. And, and I don't know what I was expecting, but what I was not expecting was envelope after envelope after envelope of actual letters the actual letters in Conan Doyle's hand uh, coming out of these boxes. And my hand started to shake (laughs) because at at that point I had never held a document that Conan Doyle himself had held. 
And, uh, you know, it's happened a number of times since, but that was the first one. And I'll never forget the feeling of the whole world faded. All the details went to, went to black around me. It was just me and the letters and, uh, uh this, this sensation of holding a document that Conan Doyle had uh, written with his own hand. Um, uh, it just, uh, just took my breath away. And, and does it ever, I, I mean, Dan, you, you have obviously written extensively about Conan Doyle. You, you know, the title of, uh, your biography of him was a life in letters. Um, does that feeling ever fade for you? Uh, sir, uh, I'm still waiting to see if it happens. It, it hasn't yet. Uh, and it's been, uh, I guess, um, 25 years or more since that, that day in Cambridge. And, uh, as I mentioned, I, you know, it's happened a number of times since that I've, uh, that, that I've held documents, but that, but there are still things and particularly things in, in Costa's collection that, uh, that, that, that make my hands shake still. Costa, as as a collector, this this has always interested me, uh, you know, because every collector has their own relationship with their material. Um, how often do you handle the the documents or or pull out the images? I mean, how how closely connected are you with with uh, what it is that you you collect? Well, I'm going to parse that out into two. Because those are two questions. Uh, in terms of how closely connected I am, I feel very closely connected. That feeling that Dan so beautifully illustrated to you before, the feeling that's still with him after all these years, okay? Um, I, I, I do feel that, and I continue to feel that, um, it is something that um, I feel responsible for. I feel that I'm a ward to this. I don't own this stuff. I don't own it. I'm its ward. That that's why I put the library together. And this is for uh, this is for me to share. This is for other people to enjoy. This is for any little insight we can to really appreciate. Doyle's genius in storytelling, a revolutionary way of getting to beginning, middle, and end, all within a 20 to 25-minute read, um, I feel very strongly about. Um, so it is a, it, it's a personal connection for me. With regards to how often do I, <laughs> how often do I handle this stuff? Um, some items, um, a couple of years can go by, and I really don't don't handle it. Uh, I look at it fairly frequently, but in terms of handling it, um, you know, and, and I I love when projects come up uh, because it's an excuse for me to reacquaint with some of the items in you know in my library. Yeah. Mm. Do you, Dan, Acosta, do you find I minutes? Mean, I just wanted to dwell a little bit more on this um, question of connection to the creator. You know, one of, there have been so many biographies of Conan Doyle, but but Dan's um, is the best. Let's it not, really is. It really Dan's is. Dan's is the best. It Absolutely. really is the best because, you know, you really get, first of all, Conan Doyle was such a remarkable man. And the nice thing about Dan's biography is that you really get all of those dimensions, you know, his, his military advocacy, his concern yeah. for justice, his government, everything, you know, really lovely. That whole, in fact, Dan's biography sort of begins with that archetypal picture, that cartoon Conan Doyle dot drew before he died of the horse and the cart labeled with all those boxes. But do you find, um, Costa, in your collection, um, deepening your affection for Conan Doyle because you, you find, you know, and Dan mentioned it in, in the handwritten note, you know, you see how he phrases his communications to other people. You see, you know, what's on his mind and, um, do you find your affection for him deepening? Oh yes. And, and admiration growing, mm -hmm. um, 
Absolutely. There are, so I, I don't necessarily collect letters, uh, but one of the letters, uh, you know, in, in a touch of irony and, you know, even, even the master storyteller would get things wrong as, as, as we all do every once in a while uh, where he is writing and it's not in front of me. I would read it to you verbatim and I apologize for not having it. It's, it's, I'm not in my library right now um, where uh, he responds to a letter to a certain lady and says that after much thought uh, that Sherlock Holmes is not fit for dramatic representation that his <laughs> talk about irony. I mean, how could, could he have been more wrong? And I so love that letter. <laughs> Um, but you know, again, there you have an example of, um, you know, know, and and I think as we all get a little bit older, um, realize what our strengths and certainly more importantly, what our limitations are Mm. to have this type of connection, you know, to a truly great author, um, is, uh, is, is wonderful and it does deepen for it does to answer your question. Hmm. Well, I, I have a, a quick story that relates to that. And uh, um, thank you for the kind words about uh, um, teller of tales. The checks are in the mail. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, while I was writing that book, uh, I particularly wanted to pay attention to Conan Doyle's interest in spiritualism. And you've all heard me yammer on about this at, at uh, at mind-numbing length, but uh, I remember being in London and I was in a bookstall on Cecil Court, and uh, I had uh, found one of Conan Doyle's spiritualism pamphlets, and it was more money than I wanted to spend, but uh, I really wanted it. It was something I had to have, so I bought it. I, I took it home, and when I opened it up, something fluttered out, and I'm looking at it now, and it was one of Arthur Conan Doyle's calling cards. And on the front, it says Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Windlesham, Crowborough, and the Athenaeum Club. And on the back, there's a hand-penciled notation. And it says, you asked about the older prophecies, so I send you this. Do let me have it back again. And then penciled ACD. <laughs> wow. I love that. Wow. I love wow. it. Wow. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, I don't even know. Uh, there, there's an there's a possibility that no one ever opened that uh, pamphlet. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was ever waiting on the card for years and years and years, and and exactly, Costa, I felt it was waiting for me. It was yeah. waiting for you. Great books, great books, great works of art find their home. Yeah. Now, how interesting, Dan, because, you know, you could do a paper for the Baker Street Journal about that, questioning his commitment to spiritualism, because if he really believed in spiritualism, would he have asked to have it sent back to him? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Great point. <laughs> oh, there's my lead. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, how deep was this conviction anyway? Yeah. Bert, Bert just gave you the intro, Dan. <laughs> That's it. That's the lead. Yeah. I look Wait forward to that. Um, well, Costa, you, you uh, just mentioned in passing um, great books, great art, finding their homes. And as you noted, when you acquired the manuscript, you also acquired a piece of art with it, an original Frederick Dorr Steele. You, you want to talk a little bit about that illustration and perhaps any observations you've made of it over the years? Um. I certainly knew that it was, you know, a very early, uh, possibly the first, and I do believe the first uh, illustration of um, Frederick Dorr Steele. Uh, Nick Utekin and I have had some correspondence, um, unpublished correspondence about this. Uh, and this did not appear in the Strand version or the American, you know, the Collier's version, which one would have expected it to, but rather um, the limited editions club. Uh, And um, irrespective, irrespective of 
was this the first or was this one of the first? It really didn't make, you know, that much of a difference to me. Um, I just, I, it, it spoke to me. It spoke to me. Is there a date on it? Did he date it with 03? He did not. Hmm. Well, and this is the image that provided the, uh, the background for the, the cover design on the jacket cover, right? That's correct. Now, the, 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 the jacket cover is, is colorized. Is the Frederick Dorr steel, uh, in color or is it, uh, is it black and white? It's mostly black and white. There are shades. Of um, th- there's some nuance in terms of the shadings, um, you, you know, normally grays, uh, blacks. Uh, Frederick Dor Steele did a lot of cut and paste, as you know, as opposed to Sidney Paget, who did not. Um, but um, th- that particular version is not colorized. The cover of the you know the the, the cover of the book, uh, which I do not have in front of me right now. Uh, looks more like it. It's a colorized. It's more of a patina that has some color in it. Uh, but that is not how the original illustration appears. Hmm. Yeah, Steele. Um, you know, he favored an orange color. He developed around 1900 sort of a, a method he invented to simplify plate making, and so he would frequently use these orange casts in his. Mm-hmm. Uh, drawings it could also be that it faded over time you know? then i think it's a combination of both i think you're absolutely spot on with that bird and it to me looks more like it's like an ochre yeah uh yeah so as as we look at the manuscript i think one of the things that uh, stands out you know at at the very first is that conan doyle was not satisfied with the original title of this story uh, and and for for those of you who who buy the book and you take the ju- dust jacket off, it's actually it it appears on the front cover in gilt. Uh, you can see it was originally titled "The Adventure of the Worst Man in London," yeah. crossed out, and of course we know now it's the adventure of Charles Augustus Milverton. What can you tell us about? the decision that Conan Doyle made there and, and, and why uh, he decided to alter the title. Nothing definitive. Uh, There are, you know, there are theories out there as to why that was the case. Um, More than one people could have donned the moniker at the time, the worst man in London. Um, The influence of his brother-in-law in terms of, you know, would this be a more apropos title? Uh, I think that there are theories, but nothing definitive in terms of, right, this is the reason why the title was changed. But I think that, uh, that the thing you point out, the actual, actually being able to see the cross out of the worst man in London and the, the, the word Charles Augustus Milverton written above it, um, illustrate what's so fabulous about this uh, manuscript series is you can see some of that progress taking shape and right before your eyes, you can see how some of the aspects of the story snapped into place uh, uh, in a way that you don't when you're uh, reading it in another form. But one of the reasons that uh, I love this story so much is that I can, it's one of a handful of stories that I can distinctly remember the feelings and impressions I had when I read it for the first time mm. as a kid. And it's so funny that, uh, that he, in, in, to my way of thinking that he, uh, abandoned the, the worst man in London, because for me, it was one of those phrases that just jumped out like to Sherlock mm. Holmes. She's always the woman and, uh, uh, the footprints of a gigantic hound. It was just one of those magical phrases that leaps off the page and, and takes root. And I just remember loving it the first time, loving that phrase the first time I read it and, uh, and, and 
it's stayed with me ever since. And, and you know, it's interesting, Dan, because Professor Moriarty gets all of the headlines, get, gets all of the, 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 <laughs> yeah. the accolades as far as villainy in the canon. And we really don't know that much about him or his operation other than what Holmes told us about his, his interaction with him. And of course, the way the story ended, um, you know, until, you know, insert coda until return came along. Um, Milverton, in many ways, is a much worse villain or, or a more ideal villain than Moriarty because we get to see him up close. We get to see the insidious nature of his business and the way he thinks about it and plans and inflicts damage on uh, the unsuspecting around London. Um, do you think he, Charles- he lays all his cards on the table, Scott? It's he just does. as you say. He lays all his cards on the table, which makes him particularly vile. Uh, and as we were speaking earlier, you know, again, Moriarty clearly the choice. You know, who could be a worse man than Moriarty? Well, Moriarty operated in the shadows. Uh, this guy's in your face. Lays his hands, lays his cards right on the table for you, unabashedly. And 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 even more so because he knows he's untouchable, or at, at yes. least he thinks he's untouchable at that point. Um, which you know he's he's kind of just twisting the knife. Just a, a, a an amazing characterization of a villain by by Conan Doyle. But to to return to the the genius of Conan Doyle. If the worst man in London is one of those uh, deathless phrases, so too is the Napoleon of crime. Once heard, never forgotten. <laughs> That's right. He yeah. certainly had a yeah. way of uh, well, certainly had a way with words. That Arthur Conan Doyle. Yeah, he did. So, as we wrap up here, just thinking in, as an overview of the manuscript, um, other than. The, the title being changed and that's standing out. What else in the manuscript stands out uh, to you? And let, let, let's start with you, Dan. Oh, in the manuscript? Yeah. Well, it's just uh, um, just to be able to uh, uh, look at it and see some of the cross outs and the uh, the things that were scribbled in, the things that uh, the choices he made along the way. Uh, are are wonderful and illuminating, but as always, I'm I know that uh, that sometimes we're not seeing a, a first draft, but it has always amazed me with whatever piece of manuscript I'm looking at, whether it's uh, the manuscript of a story or a novel or a letter, how um, clear, concise, and um, free of error. His, uh, his prose is uh, when he's setting it down on the page. Uh, I know this is an observation that a lot of people uh, um, make, but his prose is remarkably fluid. And I think the place where you see that uh, most clearly illustrated is in his correspondence, which is uh, can be, even though, even when he's talking about the most mundane of subjects, there is a lyrical quality to the prose that gets me every time. That's a great observation. Uh, what about you, Costa? Having had this manuscript in your collection now for over 20 years, uh, what stands out to you? Uh, again, crossing out that title is just fantastic. Um, and as, as just to echo what Dan had said in terms of just laying thought and, and plan to paper, um, you know, Doyle uses words uh, as a painter uses oils and pastels, just lays them out beautifully. Um, with, with again, the 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 Mozart of storytelling, just has it all in his head and lays it out. Uh, so, do, does anything particularly stand to, to out? Point of phrase. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The point of phrase. Um, I would say that, you know, the, just looking at it its entirety uh, and then mulling over every single word yet again um, was was just a, again, I, I learned something new every time I look at it. Um, 
just just an amazing experience. Mm. And and many of his, it's interesting as well. You see this with a couple of his manuscripts. He he did not do it in Milverton, but say for example in the Lion's Mane, um, he would actually cut and insert some passages in other manuscripts of phraseology that he particularly liked. Um, his hand is different on some of his rare corrections, sort of a broader stroke, a, uh, sometimes in, in, uh, in purple pencil, interestingly. And you can almost sense him getting fatigued. And if you notice the way that he, he's got a beautiful hand, the beginning of a manuscript versus the middle versus the end. You can tell when he starts to get a little bit tired. The font, the letters themselves, they become less sharp. And then you, you, you can almost sense when it's when he's writing first thing in the morning. <laughs> it's tighter. It's crisper. But it's just it's, it's, it's a joy to behold. Well, it's a joy to behold a conversation with the two of you. And from the Napoleon of crime to the Mozart of storytelling, I, <laughs> I think we've, we've covered it all here. So thank you both for joining us and telling your tales about the worst man in London. Thank you so much. It's been a for pleasure. Having. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Bert. I don't think that we covered in the discussion with, with Dan and Costa the one great point, the real contribution, the ground, most groundbreaking and most important thing, not only about the manuscript series, but about certainly the Milverton case. And I don't know, we've never mentioned it, even in all of the other books that we've, um, shows we've done about the manuscript series. The one unique thing in contribution to literature here is that having these manuscripts, these reproductions, these presentations of the manuscript in book form for everyone to look at, that we've avoided um, providing any stimulus to those people who have the argument that the cases of Sherlock Holmes were really written by Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon? Yeah. Yeah, when he was done writing Shakespeare's plays, Uh (laughs) uh, he... He also turned out a few of these, and uh, thank goodness we don't have that. But, you know, the lovely thing about this, about the manuscript series, which we really should have called out, but it's nice to see it again. The general editor of the series is Andy Fusco, and there's a preface to the series in which Andy um, really does a lovely job about describing the inclusivity of the world of people who are interested in Sherlock Holmes. And it's not just people who annotate manuscripts and write um, certain articles, certain certain more scholarly articles. Um, Andy just does a great job in his, in his general editor's foreword and preface to the series um, about the inclusivity of this. There truly is something new under the sun on virtually every page of the canon. And um, uh, just as we value diversity in all aspects of society, we recognize the intellectual diversity among Sherlockians and Holmesians around the world. I just really like reading that. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, whether you, you pick up one of these books or whether you go to a Sherlockian meeting or engage in Sherlockian discussion online. There's something for everyone here. Uh, the, you can find whatever it is you need to find at a meeting, in the original stories. Um, it, and, and we've said this before too, Bert, that, uh, the, the canon is a microcosm of the world. It, it's a, it's a snapshot of humanity. And if you can't find what you're looking for in it, then, well, well, maybe, maybe you should broaden your reading, I guess. <laughs> yeah, look wider. Well, that music means it's time to look wider, to look toward Canonical Couplets. Yes, everyone's favorite Sherlockian quiz show, where we give you two lines of poetry about one of the stories, and you have to identify what it is. 
the winner, of course, gets a prize. Now, the last time we were here, this was the clue. A wild goose chase is sometimes all you need to accommodate this object of a felon's greed. Bert, do you know which story we're talking about? Yes, yes, that's the case of the kidnapped vegetarian, the one that Watson called the missing tree hugger. <laughs> oh, almost, almost, Bert. <laughs> you know, you're getting closer every time. What? No, you're not, actually. Um, oh. no, I'm sorry. We were looking for the adventure of the three Garadebs. Adventure of the three Garadebs. Oh. And, you know, we, we confused a number of people who threw in uh, the Red-Headed League as their guess. And it was an excellent guess because basically the three Garadebs and the Red-Headed League are the same plot some 30 years apart or so. Uh, so that was, uh, that was good. But we already did cover... Uh, the Red-Headed League earlier on. I'm trying to remember what the canonical couplet was for the Red-Headed League. Do you ken John Clay in his dark room safely hid? That's a lot more than Jabez Wilson did. Right? That was back on <laughs> episode 185, not all that long ago. So uh, we do have uh, a winner, and you know what? We don't have to pull out the prize wheel this time because there was only... One correct answer. And get this. It was from Mark Jones, who was our guest on the last episode. So he really put in all the work for episode 193. Congratulations, Mark. And now, here's the canonical couplet for this episode. A figure at the window gave a fright that took a note from Holmes. To set a right. If you know the answer to this canonical couplet, put it in an email to comment at ihearofsherlock.com with the subject canonical couplet. If you are among all of the correct answers and we choose you at random, you'll win a prize. Good luck. And the prize you'll be competing for is a set of Baker Street journals from 2019, including the Christmas Annual. Well, Bert, can you believe we've done it again? It's incredible how we managed to do this fabulous. And, and by the way, while we're wearing our surgical masks, yeah. I'm impressed. Please. Uh, it, we, we have been socially distancing for this podcast since 2007. <laughs> uh, That's we're, right. We're doing it right. We're doing it right. I, I, I hear of Sherlock everywhere, COVID-19 free since 2007. That's right. Completely pre-sanitized for your listening pleasure. Well, we'd like to remind you to uh, certainly subscribe to the show, wash your hands, stay careful out there, and stay tuned because we'll be back at the end of the month on the 30th for another episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. In the meantime, I'm Scott Monty. And completely irrelevantly, I'm Burt Wolder. And together we say... The, the game's, game's afoot. <laughs> the, the game's afoot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> <laughs>